Hello friends, happy Monday. Hope your day is going great so far. Um, let's jump right into our study. So again, we're going through the book Essential Truths of Christian Faith, of The Christian Faith by R.C. Sproul. Um, and just reflecting on going through this book and going through a lot of things that I feel like Christians ought to know. Christians that call themselves followers of Christ, that believe in the Bible to be um, the Word of God. Um, and I feel like going through these concepts, I don't know about you, but I'm like thinking like, okay, is it really necessary to know all this? Is it really necessary to go deep into who God is and, um, just wrestle with questions that are kind of tough to answer, um, and such. And I was re reflecting on that this morning when I read through the chapter, which is chapter 19 that we're going to be going through. Um, and I was just reminded of the fact that when we do, when we go deeper into who God is and into the truths that have been revealed to us in scripture, which is so many, there's so much truth here for us to know about God, um, that that is what it means to get closer to God. Like our faith is strengthened. Um, when we see these attributes of God, this, you know, this decrees of God to know that he's omnipotent, to know that he's omnipresent, to know that he's omniscient, to know that he know, know that he know everything, to know that he is good and why he's good. Um, I don't know about you, but it makes his promises like even bigger and the promises that he have in scripture and things that we can cling to. It makes it that much real, you know, to know this is real. This is, um, a real God that we serve. My faith in him it just becomes greater and we ultimately fall more in love with him when we get to know him. Um, I remember like when we and my husband dated, right? We didn't want to spend time away from each other. We were on the phone. We would talk to like three in the morning. Um, the more I knew about him, the better. I wanted to know him so well. You know, what was his favorite food? What did he like? What was his favorite color, etc. Even like the most dumbest thing. I would enjoy that. I would enjoy getting to know him. Um, and that is what we're doing when we're going deep into his word and we're opening even just this book and seeing these attributes from God that we get from scripture, that we pull from scripture. Um, we're getting to know our God more and that and, and in that way we delight more in him. Um, I feel like for years I would read like the book, you know, of Psalms and Proverbs and it's like delight in the Lord. He is your joy. He is your refuge. And I feel like all those things were kind of empty to me because I'm like, oh, yeah, but I don't really know who this guy, this God is. I, I really want him to be my joy. I really want to trust him. I really want to, but I just felt like there was a distance. Um, and we keep on making, you know, that distance becomes shorter and shorter and shorter when we really do roll up our sleeves and really get to know God um, and the study of God, which is theology, the study of God and his scripture and who he is. It makes us, you know, uh, the promises that he have, has in his word become more real. They're magnified and we, our faith just grows in him. So that has been very um, just encouraging for me to go through these books and th go through this book and these chapters and go through, you know, the justice of God, go through the goodness of God, the holiness of God, you know, the omniscience of God, you know, um, what, how do we interpret the Bible and all that, you know what I'm saying? the result is that we fall more in love with God and our faith, like I said, grows. So I have been loving that. I just wanted to share that with you guys that I kind of, you know, was wrestling with this morning. Like, is this even just, you know, getting anywhere and just knowing facts? And these are not just facts. Like, they are facts about God, but they have an end result, which is for us to um, delight more in Him and have more joy in Him and His Word and confidence in who it is, you know, that this God who we're serving, which is the one true God. So, today's chapter, um, actually we start a new section, it's called, uh, this is part three of the book, and it's called The Works and the Decrees of God. Now we're going to see the works of Him, um, this beautiful, amazing, omniscient being that we call God, Yahweh. Um, and so chapter 19 talks about creation, okay? Um, and we obviously believe that God created, you know, everything and using even like logic and philosophy, which honestly, for a while, I feel like I was not a fan of because I thought I was just dumb and I didn't get it. And I was like, what do you mean? What does this mean? And why are you just questioning it? Just believe it, you know? And there's like these brilliant philosophers who just sit back and like trying to analyze this world. Um, and pretty much if you don't have the Bible, it doesn't make sense. Anything else doesn't make sense. There, th There's no sense in this world and why we're even here and the existence of us in this world, in this universe, 
if we don't have scripture to walk us through it you know so it's kind of like funny to see them try to use their logic to like come up with things um but that's kind of what R.C. Sproul uses in this chapter. He uses logic and philosophy to come up with the fact that um, God is real and there is nothing else that really explains even why we're here. So he he's brilliant. Like this, this guy's brilliant. And he even uses that philosophy and logic um, to prove that there is a God. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, so let's jump right into it. Again, chapter 19. It's called Creation. It says, um... Let me, look at, let me look at the time to make sure I'm not going like over what I should be. Okay. Everything in time and space had a beginning. So he's talking about the very, very beginning of anything. He says, I had a beginning. You know, you had a beginning. The houses we live in had a beginning. You know, the clothes we wear had a beginning. You know, there was a time when our houses, our clothes, cars, washing machines, and ourselves did not exist. There was a time, you know. They were not, okay? Nothing could be more obvious in that sense. Like, you know, obviously before my parents conceived me, I was not like my physical being. I did not exist in that sense, okay? So says nothing could be more obvious than that. Um, because we are surrounded by things and by people that obviously had a beginning, we are tempted to jump to the conclusion that everything had a beginning. So because we look at the world and we think, okay, you know, things were not once and now they are, we are tempted to say everything at one time had a beginning, okay? Um, stay with me. <laughs> like I said, we are tempted to jump to the conclusion that everything had a beginning. Such a conclusion, however, would be a fatal leap into the abyss of absurdity. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, it would be fatal to religion. It would also be fatal to science and to reason. For us to think that absolutely everything in this world had a beginning and an end would be fatal when it comes to science and reason and logic. Okay, and he's going to explain over here why. He goes, why did I not say that everything in time and place had a beginning? Isn't that the same thing as saying simply that everything had a beginning? By no means, okay? It is simply logically and scientifically impossible that everything had a beginning. Why? If everything that exists once had a beginning, then there had to be a time where nothing existed. So he's saying for us to think that, okay, because we, we have this reasoning that we think everything has a beginning and an end, you know, um, there would have to be a time where there was nothing right for us to think well everything that we can conceive that we can think of had a beginning there had to be a time where there was nothing okay um he says here stop for a moment to reflect try to imagine nothing existing and i've done this before like okay close your eyes think of like when nothing was nothing ever existed and i would get like a headache i'm like i can't even think of that like our mind is not suitable to think that you know think of a time when there was nothing like nothing existed for me it would be like everything is just black but even black like that you know that wouldn't be it because black would have existed you see what i'm saying um absolutely nothing he says we can't even conceive an absolute nothingless our mind cannot conceive an absolute nothingness okay the very concept is merely the negation of something all right he says yet if there ever was such a time when absolutely nothing existed what would there be now so he goes if we think of back you know when there was nothing that existed existed then what is it that we're living in now and this is what he says he says right he goes if you at one point and this is where like i had to read this chapter like three times because i'm like what is he saying i honestly think that these concepts don't come easy to me like that's why i have to read them over and over and over and i'm like what what so we read it again he's like if at one point there was nothing that nothing existed um then he's making the leap of saying if that is true then what we have right now is still nothing. And I was like, what? So let's continue on because he has a point here, okay? He says, yes, if there, yet, if there ever was such a time when, I, um, what would there be now? He goes, right, nothing, nothing would be now. If ever there was nothing, then by resistless logic, there would always be nothing. So if in the beginning, 
If there was a time that there was nothing, then there we have nothing now, is what he's saying, and there will always be nothing, right? Which doesn't make sense because obviously there is something here. I'm here, you're there, right? But in believing that at one point there was nothing, we could conclude in some way, somehow, that we have nothing now and that there will always be nothing, okay? Um, there's not even an always during which there could be nothing. Why can we be so sure indeed, absolutely certain, that if ever there was nothing, then there would be nothing now? Like, how could we make that leap? How could we say if there was nothing in the beginning or there was nothing at one point, now we still don't have anything or anything? The, a the answer is astonishingly, astonishingly simple. Despite the fact that extremely intelligent people often stumble over obvious or the obvious, the answer is simply that you can't get something from nothing, which means there always had to be something. If we made the conclusion that at one point there was nothing, um, then we wouldn't even exist. You see what I'm saying? I wouldn't even be here. Um, and that just simply is not true because I'm obviously here. You're looking at me. I can't look at you, but you're looking at me and I'm here. So he's saying this to prove that there always was something, okay? Just because our minds can't conceive that, just because we think, okay, everything has a beginning, everything has an end. Um, it doesn't, and we're going to go on to why the fact is that there has to be something that did not have a beginning or did not have a beginning so that we could be here, okay? Have I lost you yet? <laughs> again, I had to read this like a thousand times to like really get it, okay? So again, it says the answer is simply that you can't get something from nothing, all right? An absolute law of science and logic is called ex, ex nibilo nibil fit. I don't know what kind of language that is, but that means out of nothing, nothing comes, right? So if I want to make something, I need to have something to make something. I can't have nothing and produce something out of it, okay? Again, confirming the fact that there has to be something in the beginning that have always been for us to even exist, all right? Nothing cannot produce anything. Nothing can't laugh sing, cry, work, dance, or breathe. It certainly can't create it. Nothing can do anything because it isn't anything. Let me repeat that again, sorry. He says, nothing can't do anything because it isn't anything. So there's no way that not having anything could produce something that is, okay? This is where I'm like, I scratch my head and I'm like, okay, continue reading because I'm getting a little lost. <laughs> it doesn't exist, he says. It has no power whatsoever because it has no being. So he's talking about nothing. Like when there simply is nothing, all right, um, there's no way that we can get something that laughs, that cries, that plays from nothing, okay? So since you and I exist, there has, to, again, has to be something that created us, that came, that did not come from nothing, okay? All right, for something to come out of nothing, it would have to possess the power of self-creation. So if we say that we came from nothing, then we have to have the power to self-create ourselves, is what he's saying. It would have to be able to create itself or bring itself into existence. But that is a manifest absurd absurdity, okay? For something to create or produce itself, it would have to be before it is. But if something already is, it doesn't need to be created. To create itself, something would have to be and not be. Exist and not exist. At the same time, in the same respect, okay? That is a contradiction. And we talked about this earlier in the book, that contradictions cannot be. Not even God can fix contradictions because a contradiction says that you are and you're not. You exist and you don't exist, okay? Contradictions. It says, it violates the most fundamental of all rational and scientific laws, the laws of non-contradiction. 
So it doesn't make sense. It does not make sense to say that we came from nothing. Okay? If we know anything, we know that if anything exists now, then somehow, somewhere, something did not have a beginning. For you and I to exist right now, like I said, there has to be something that has always existed to create us so that we are the product of it. Okay? It can't be simply nothing. So I love how he uses logic reasoning philosophy to get to the point that obviously there is a god so let's continue he says i am aware that brilliant thinkers such as and he named somebody here called bertrand russell um in his famous debate with i guess another guy called frederick copleston argued that the present universe is the result of an infinite series of finite causes so these two brilliant thinkers like They're brilliant for a reason because people think they're brilliant (laughs) and that they're smart. Um, What they could come up with uh, to actually not to say that, not to prove that there is no God. They're saying, well, the universe is just infinite series of finite causes, meaning that there's a power that's just infinite, meaning that has always been, okay? And it's just causing little finite causes, meaning it's causing little things that have a beginning and an end, okay? Yeah, I know. It possesses like this infinite series, possesses an endless series, working backwards into eternity of one cost thing costing another forever. Like it doesn't make sense. This idea merely compounds the problem of self-creation infinitely. It is a fundamentally silly concept. It's silly. It's like dumb. Like what in the world? So you have this series that's infinite and just because it feels like it, it starts producing finite causes like life, like earth that, you know, that have a beginning. Um, so it just randomly, you know, it causes this. So that's what he's saying. He's like, it's fundamentally silly. It's a silly concept. The fact that it has been proposed by intellect in, uh, intelligent people makes it no less silly. He's saying that even people who are brilliant, who are coming up with these silly concepts... Um, doesn't make them any less silly, meaning they're actually very silly. Com- you know, thinking that somebody that's really bright should come up with these 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 silly concepts. Um, it's worse than silly, he's saying. Silly things can be real, but this concept is logically impossible. So he's actually making fun of them. He's saying, okay, you guys are brilliant people. And just to j- deny that there's a God, you're coming up with this silly concept. And he's saying, even silly things can be true. But he's like, this right here is worse than silly. This concept is silly because it's just literally impossible. Why would you even come up with that? And we see that even in science nowadays, that people come up with the most funniest things that you're just like, what? Like something coming out of nothing. Just simply to say there is no God. And that's why, honestly, reading the scriptures and knowing, you know, God and his and his word and even our existence here and our purpose clicks so well with even logic and reasoning that logic and reasoning prove the fact that there has to be a god it's amazing so that's what he's doing here in this chapter so i'm gonna stop right there we're halfway through the chapter this chapter is actually a little longer than uh any of the other chapters and we will finish this tomorrow if this uh study gave you a headache like it did when i first read this chapter just listen to it again um and if not if you want to know more then get the book you know, private message me and I can send you a link to where you can buy it. Um, again, it's called Essential Truths of Christian Faith. But it gets like these are the wheels turning in our mind and our head to really think, hey, logically and and, and logically and, um, you know, using our mind, we can't even prove that way that there absolutely has to be a God. So um, anyways, <laughs> I'm going to go take a Tylenol because my head's hurting already. Just kidding. Um, but yeah, that's about it, guys. Love you. Um, if you have any questions, private message me and we can talk about it. Um, have an amazing day and I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye.